So record on this computer. We are recording. Does it tell you guys recording in process when I start recording? I'm just curious. I've never actually seen that from that side. I see it from my side. Oh, it does? Cool. So we're going to talk about endurance and resistive concepts today. So talking about different things. So we'll talk about some terms like physical activity, exercise, physical fitness, some general stuff. We're really going to hit the, um, the energy uh, stores and how we build up at muscle and stuff like that a little bit today, which is kind of important. So the energy systems, these should be fairly much review because I'm pretty sure um, Dr. Mallets went through these with you guys back in anatomy. If you didn't, we'll do a quick review of them. These are our three primary energy systems we go through. So we have our first system would be our phosphagen or ATP PC system. Then we have our anaerobic and then we have our aerobic system, right? So that phosphagen or that ATP PC system is probably the quickest reacting in our muscles. It kind of is what gets the muscles going. It is an anaerobic activity, meaning it's using ATP in the cells and not using any oxygen. So anytime you see those anaerobic type things, that means we're not actually burning oxygen when we use those energy cycles, right? And you do have to know these for your boards. You don't have to go into like the full depth of drawing the, the aerobic versus the anaerobic cycle, which I had to do in my, um, in my PT program because I went through and had physiology with, you know, athletic trainers and nurses and stuff like that. But we do have to understand that we start with that ATP PC system when we start firing off our muscles. And then as our muscles need more energy, we move to the glycolytic system. And then once we move out of that, we move to the aerobic system. So it is a process. So for those first 90 or so seconds of exercise, you're not typically using oxygen. You're not doing an oxidative type activity. So you're not burning off, you know, fats or proteins or anything like that. Most of the time in that first 90 seconds, you're using locally stored muscle energy. And that could be using a little bit of muscle protein, but primarily it's using a lot of the ATP that's stored in the actual muscle cells themselves. The downside to these two anaerobic systems is if you use them heavily, lactic acid is the byproduct, right? And what can lactic acid do when it builds up in our muscles? What happens when we have a lot of lactic acid in our muscles? Yeah, they get sore, they get tight, you get DOMS, exactly, right? How do we overcome that buildup of lactic acid? What are some treatments for it? Do it again, okay, pump it out, movement. And just like anything else we have too much of in our system, yeah, water, exactly. Anytime we have a byproduct in our system, we kind of want to flush out, water helps kind of flush that out, right? It's the old adage that the more you hydrate, the more stuff goes out. It makes sense. You will urinate a lot of that lactic acid out. But it's not until we get up here to this aerobic system that we start burning through our kind of our glycogen and our fats and our proteins, right? Now, understand that just because you do aerobic exercise doesn't mean you're going to get super slender right? You know, just because you go do, you know, two hours of cardio a day doesn't necessarily mean you're instantly going to become skinny. Because the body has a preferential way of burning through energy. The first thing it's going to try to burn through is any of your glucose stores. Why is it going to go for glucose first? Yeah, it's fast burning, right? It burns energy. And the other thing is, is glucose is a simple sugar, right? So breaking that down into ATP is not that hard. 
the higher we go up on the food chains here, right, the harder it is. Now, there is some research out there that indicates that maybe protein may actually be easier to break down than fats, especially certain types of fats. So even if you're doing one of those where you're doing kind of a high aerobic energy activity and you're trying to burn off that fat off your body, your body may cannibalize itself first. It may cannibalize some of your muscle itself to provide you with that energy. Um, our body is not good at differentiating, right? That's why I always love when you see like late at night and those commercials come on for the um, eight minute abs activity and stuff like that. Where it's like, do these exercises and it burns the fat off your belly. Not really. Do people lose weight and lose inches of their waist from doing those activities? Sure. But they equally lose it from doing anything else. Right? They're not going to, it's not going to target that area. Yeah, we have genetics that play a critical role. Trust me. I know that, Stephanie. You know, I, I, I don't think any of you think I'm a tiny person but I am the tiniest of my family. My dad was 460. Um, my younger brother is around 435. Both of my sisters are in the high 300s. My older brother is in the high 300s in weight, right? Genetics definitely come into play. Yeah, my, uh, my family definitely, um, don't put them on the front of the roller coaster. That will definitely accelerate that roller coaster down the hill. Um, but yeah, I'm the smallest in my family because I do one of the exercises they don't do, and that's called push away, where I push myself away from the table. But so when we're talking about burning through these things, we also have to talk about the types of motor units in our muscles. I don't have them on a roller coaster with you. I don't know. I might jump tracks there, Ariane. I don't know if you want to. I'm just saying. So when we talk about that energy system, we also have to make sure we talk about the types of muscle fibers. Did you guys cover these in anatomy at all? Do you remember a little bit about this? Anything? Slow and fast? Okay, good. Good news is for your boards, you don't really have to know about these down here, the type one or type two X's, but you do kind of have to know the difference between your type ones, your type twos, and then also your type two A's, or type two A's and type two B's, right? Your type ones are also called your aerobic fibers. The other thing you may see them referred to in a lot of the textbooks are your red fibers. Why do you think they might be listed as red fibers of muscles in textbooks? Yeah, right. They have a lot. So not necessarily oxygen, but they have a lot of hemoglobin content, right? They're big users of blood because they need oxygen, right? And a lot of times when you see these, the fast twitch or the anaerobic, you usually call them the white fibers. These are the ones that don't use as much oxygen. They typically are anaerobic, but they do have a slight aerobic usage to them, right? So our type ones are slow contractors. They resist a lot of fatigue. They're used for aerobic activities. They can be used for hours. They don't produce a high amount of power, but they're really dense in capillaries, mitochondria, and oxygen, right? The good news about these when you use these long-term is they also help eat up some of that lactic acid that the other muscles produce. And then when we talk about the type A, type 2A and type 2Bs, those are the ones that kind of allow us to do our shorter activity ac exercises, right? Type 2Bs are typically less than a minute. Type 2As are typically less than 30 minutes. These type 2Xs, I've been seeing a lot of them referred to, excuse me, as undifferentiated. And there's a lot of research out there right now trying to figure out if you can change your muscle fiber dominant or muscle fiber dominance. 
And if you look at most of the research, they'll say no. Um, we'll say that no, you're, you know, you are what you are, right? But there is some science that show that you can convert some of your type 2Bs into type 2As, which give you a little bit more endurance. Uh, this is where I talked about, I, have a, I had a really funny story about this. So my older sister who um, is a nurse, she was dating a physiologist back in Pennsylvania. And the physiologist was the physiologist for the Philadelphia Eagles or physiatrist, not physiologist, physiatrist, right? So he's an internal medicine doctor specialized in exercise. And just to kind of show how long ago this was, this was back when Ricky Waters was on the Philadelphia Eagles. And they had this neat force plate. I went down, I got to tour the Eagles facility and I was totally geeking out because of all the cool stuff they have. Um, and that was back before I was as cool as I am now, I must say. But they had this neat uh, device in there that they use on all the athletes that come in. And he uses this, this force plate to determine where their dominance is in their muscle fibers. Because if he can help determine their dominance in muscle fibers, he can then provide that to the athletic trainers and they can develop an exercise program better suited to those athletes, which is actually kind of cool. The, uh, the force plates idea is you get on the force plate and for five minutes, you jump up and down. And you just keep jumping up and down and 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 up and down for five minutes. Does that sound like fun to anyone? It wasn't very much fun for me. And Mark's like, no. So what you got to see was they rated your time in what they called T air versus T ground. And so what the idea was, as you jumped up and down for that five minutes, they were seeing, you know, did your time in the air and the time on the ground stay kind of level, right? Or how did it change? And so he had shown me like Ricky Waters and Ricky Waters was pretty much level for five minutes. His time in the air versus time on the ground was pretty even, right? Uh, mine went like this. <laughs> My time in the air as that five minutes went along started becoming a lot and a lot less. I tried it. He's like, come on, you can do it five minutes. By about like two and a half minutes, I'm like, this sucks. By about three minutes, I'm like, I'm dying. Four minutes, I was pretty sure I was dead. And by the five minute mark, I collapsed. Um, and no longer were my feet on the ground. My whole body was on the ground. But it was just kind of interesting to see that they can use that kind of force plate and they can see, you know, obviously what they'll see it's not necessarily a line. They'll see that time in the air, time on the ground, time in the air, time on the ground, and see kind of this flow, and then see what happens if you're spending more and more time on the ground as they go through it, which is actually pretty cool. And if you work in a clinic that deals with a lot of athletes, you may have some cool stuff like that. I'm going to be honest, for the most part, dealing with our patients, we don't get that far into it because we see them for... 30 to 60 minutes. It's very unlikely we're going to work heavily on the type of fibers they have. But this could play into the fact if some of you, you know, maybe some of you, that's what you want to do is you want to work with high end athletes. And God love you if you do, because they, that's pretty, that's a difficult task working with those athletes. And so you will have to come back and learn some of this. But so just remember that your type ones are your reds or your aerobics. Your type twos are primarily your anaerobic or your combos. And those are going to be using less of the oxygen. Now, when you start doing resistive activities with these muscle fibers, your bodies will start adapting. And this includes both aerobic and just pure resistance, but your body will start adapting there'll be neural adaptations that take place. And you guys can actually feel this sometimes when you go to the gym. Because the first time that you do a new, think about the first time that you do a new weight activity or maybe you're doing a new type of a curl 
or maybe a switch from a regular bench press to an incline or a decline press. The first couple of times you do that, you're kind of uncoordinated. It doesn't go as smoothly as your, yeah, it's, there's that CNS learning curve. You're exactly right. And then as you get better and better at it, just like anything else, it becomes more and more smooth, right? And when you're doing resistive activities, a lot of times you're going to end up with hypertrophy, right? That's the, the, that is what we also know as what in the gym? That's what we call our gains, right? So Mark asked, can one change? So, uh, so let me answer the question. So Ariana first asked, is PT, are we supposed to write what fiber it, or it depends? You're not going to typically get that far into the weeds with your patients. You do have to understand, though, Ariana, that some of your patients are going to be one fiber dominant. It's pretty rare that you have somebody that's pretty even. Um, most patients are going to either be aerobic dominant or they're going to be what we'd typically consider. You know, the typical considerations are either aerobic or power dominant. So we're not really going to get that far into it unless you are working with athletes. And then, yeah, you may actually have to determine what type of fibers they have. And then Mark says, can one change from fiber? So the studies that I have seen, it doesn't mean that this, there won't be studies in the future. The studies I have seen that you can't change from a type two to a type one, Mark. What the studies that I've seen have shown is that you can adapt some of your type two Bs into type two As, which gives you more aerobic capacity. And so you can kind of make the fibers that you have more efficient. Exactly like, oh yeah, there's a, it makes the efficiency of the fibers that you already have. You got it. Yeah. So it'll give you a little bit more aerobic capacity. And I think like, I, I don't know about you, but I got the, uh, the same kind of process. You know, when I started running for the first time, because I, I honestly have never ran a, like growing up in high school, even playing football, I didn't run. You know, my job as a fullback was go four yards, hit somebody really hard. That was my job. Um, that didn't require a lot of running, right? It, it inquired, required a lot of power usually. So there wasn't a lot of running involved with that. And then I started kind of training and getting myself to where finally, I think it was like when I was in PTA school, I was finally able to run a full mile. And then, you know, I got to where I'm running 5K and that's, I'm, I'm happy with that. I don't need to run any more than that. If I have to outrun zombies more than a 5K, they can just have me. But I could feel almost my body adapting to that. I could feel that I was gaining a little bit more endurance with it, but I hit a wall. There, that 5K for me right now is kind of a wall. I just can't seem to break that wall. So I don't doubt that there is a, a little bit of adaptation that can occur. I don't know that I would ever adapt to being able to do run a marathon. I don't know. Maybe if I did enough that I cared, but I don't care enough to do that much. So hypertrophy is where we get our gains, right? That's where the muscles look swole. That's our swole bros. All of us are capable of hypertrophy. And actually most of the muscles in our body are capable of hypertrophy, whether it's something as simple as a facial muscle or something as complex as your ab quadrants, right? Dealing with all the different ab muscles. They're all able to hypertrophy and gain bulk. But hyperplasia is one that's a very questionable when we're talking about actual adaptation to resistive exercise. And what hyperplasia is, instead of just hypertrophy where the muscles swell, hyperplasia is where you grow new muscle fibers. And again, most of the research that's out there says that we don't really gain new muscle fibers, but like Mark had suggested, the fibers become more efficient and the fibers themselves, so those monofibrils that we have in our muscles, actually increase in size and therefore are able to perform more. It'd be really cool, you're right, if we could find a way to actually perform hyperplasia of our muscles. Now, HGH, that, that's where I was, you, you are exactly where, Josh, get out of my head. There are some studies that maybe taking supplements like HGH may cause some hyperplasia to occur. Um, it's evidenced by Peyton Manning's forehead. Just look at the size of his muscles in his forehead. 
they, no, it's joking. Um, you guys realize that was like a big scandal back in the day, right? Is that because he was on HGH for his, I think he's got type one diabetes or whatever. It costs his forehead to grow. And that was proof that he was taking steroids. It was hilarious. I love that one. I think it was just that his hair was receding back his head, but what do I know? Science. But yeah, there is some, there are some studies that there shows stuff like HGH may assist in either A, replicating the fibers is what they really think it is. They don't think that necessarily, you know, that new fibers grow, but you almost get the mitosis of existing fibers, if that makes sense, where they kind of split and you get additional fibers that way. Yeah, you get clones, right. Now your anabolic steroids cause this, right? Your anabolic steroids are what are gonna trigger hypertrophy. So even those, you know, those roid heads that go out and take anabolic steroids really don't get new fibers. They just get much larger versions of the fibers they have. Um, and has anyone ever seen like somebody that was on a long-term course of anabolic steroids and then stops taking steroids? What happens to their body? It's kind of sad. Their body basically like, yeah, they, well, the more they get hormone issues, yeah. But their body kind of melts is the best way to put it. Yeah, they withdraw. And a lot of times, if they're male, they'll get gynecomastia, right? And it, they just definitely, there's problems there. And we can, we can talk all day long about the positives and negatives because there are some positive to steroids. I'm not going to say that all steroids are bad, right? There's a lot of research lately, especially in excuse me, men, once you crest that 40 year mark about taking testosterone replacement, because yes, I hate to say it guys, just like Frank Thomas advertises on the television. Once you go over that 40 year mark, your testosterone count starts decreasing. Doesn't mean you're any less likely to make babies, but it definitely decreases your testosterone count. And that affects everything for guys, right? It's the same thing, you know, that's, that's where we go through our menopause versus menopause. And we talked about muscle fiber adaptation, right? When we actually start gain, getting some either cardiovascular or resistive exercise, our blood vessels are gonna adapt as well, right? And that may be leading to some of the hypertrophy of the muscles is we get angiogenesis occurring where we get new blood vessels growing and providing more blood flow to those muscles. The more blood flow we get to those muscles, the more nutrients that can get to those muscles. The more nutrients that can get to those muscles, the larger those muscles grow. Kind of makes sense, right? But on top of that, in order to get any of this, whether we're talking about hypertrophy in muscles, vascular growth, there has to be sufficient nutrients there as well, right? We have to have sufficient levels of proteins. We have to have sufficient levels of all your vitamins. Otherwise, this growth won't occur. Um, I've seen some people in the past, you know, and I've, I've treated some patients, especially in the psych ward, where they exercise consistently and exercise becomes their almost their addictive drug of choice. And especially when they get eating disorders that go along with those, where they may get anorexia nervosa, specifically, I'm thinking about with this, where they're not eating because they don't want to gain weight. And so they exercise, so they don't gain weight doesn't matter how much they exercise, they don't get a ton of hypertrophy because they're not getting sufficient nutrients in their body then to get those gains, right? So that all kind of comes down to that. Metabolically, the more you exercise, whether it's resistive or aerobic again, the better your body gets at processing all of those materials in your body. And this is why you know, as you first start exercising, you usually get a pretty good gain of weight loss when you first start, right? How many of you guys have ever experienced this? You go to the gym and you're just rocking it for several weeks and you're starting to see that weight kind of taper down, right? Maybe you lose a few inches off your waist in those first couple of weeks. You're like, yeah, this is awesome. And then what happens? Yeah. Perp right? You hit that kind of plateau point and you're like, why am I doing this? Yeah. Your muscles adapt. Everything kind of 
gets stuck there and you're like, ah, oh, this sucks. Why am I not changing? Well, it's because you have to kind of then adapt to that and you plateau. And so then you have to get off that plateau. And it's an ever changing type of activity when you're doing that type of stuff. With your connective tissue, your tendons, your ligaments, and most of the connective tissue in the muscle do grow stronger the more you do resistive and aerobic exercise. That means the connection to the bone becomes stronger, the connection to the muscle itself becomes stronger, your bone to bone connection becomes stronger, which also then helps prevent injury. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of research that shows that something as simple as walking can help prevent falls because weight bearing on bones is how bones absorb minerals. So that means just getting up and even for patients that can't walk, just getting up and standing can be huge. Um, a lot of doctors that, <coughs> I'm sorry guys, a lot of docs that treat spinal cord injury patients we we'll want those spinal cord injury patients to stand in a stander for an hour or so during the day. That doesn't mean that patient's gonna stand on a regular basis. All that means is that they want their bones to absorb that ground force. So hopefully the bones stay strong enough that they don't fracture and become brittle, right? So all we do get a ton of changes just by exercising. When we're talking about those energy systems and inefficiency, we have to quantify the energy expenditure. That's where we talk back to that kilocalorie that we learned back in physics, right? We originally learned in physics that one calorie is enough to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius, right? And then we talk about the kilocalorie because kilocalories are in all of our substances we eat, right? That's what's on this label. That's why if you look on this, let me find it. Does it have, yeah. So if you look on, I don't know if I can get it in focus or not. But if you look at the calorie count focus, right here, focus right here. It's not focus. There we go. Calorie is capitalized on my soda. And the reason calorie is capitalized is because that's really talking about a kilocalorie. In all of our foods, we talk about kilocalories. So when you see something that's actually 200 calories on your food, right? In reality, it's 200,000 calories with a small c. But could you imagine how depressing that would be if that was how we listed our foods? I don't know, that would be really depressing seeing that you, you have, each food is like 200,000 calories. I think part of it is that we uh, realized that we needed to cut down on the labels. And part of it is that people would completely be depressed if they're eating a 200,000 calorie meal. So how do we measure these calories? Well, they do. Like say you're gonna have a bowl of Campbell's soup. How do they know how many calories are in Campbell's soup? Does anyone know? Yeah, they light it on fire. You're exactly right, Josh. They light it on fire, see how much, and more importantly, how much it raises water's temperature because water is our basic, right? This is one calorie is also, if you remember back to physics, one calorie is also 4.186 joules of energy, right? I know physics, you guys hated that class. So when we talk about these kilocalories for every five kilocalories, you burn, you actually burn through about one liter of oxygen. So when you're eating something that maybe is a, when you think about it, like a 20 calorie snack, let me put it as a big C, 20 calorie snack. In order to burn off that 20 calorie snack, you're going to have to burn through four liters of oxygen. which was gonna require a good bit of exercise, right? It doesn't go away. It's not like just sitting around, you burn through a ton of calories, right? Everyone has a resting um, 
metabolism, right? Just sitting around like this we're doing now, we do burn through some calories. We don't burn through a ton. I, I would say that I burn through a ton because I'm fidgety constantly. That's why I constantly have to have something in my hand to keep myself busy or I'm going to be fidgeting constantly. When we talk about exercise specifically in the clinic, we're going to talk about primarily dealing with light, moderate, and heavy activities. And the way that we talk about that in the clinic is on this rate of perceived exertion, right? So the original RPE scale, and I want to say it was done designed by Borg, if I remember correctly. I don't know, I always just called it the RPE. So you will be assimilated. Was originally, I think it's a six to 20 or a six to 22 scale. So what that states is you used to say to patients, I would be working with Josh and I'd say, Josh, on a scale of six to 22, with six being you didn't work very hard, 22, you're exhausted, how would you rate that activity? And Josh would look at me like, what? That doesn't make any sense, McKeever. Uh, yeah, 14.865, right. The interesting thing about this scale is it correlates to cardiac output. which is why it was originally this kind of six to 22 scale. There is a correlation that you can make and there's a formula you can do and I'm not gonna make you do it. I learned it in my physiology class. It's not important for the boards. So huzzah. Most of the time now, when you're looking at a chart, you'll see it listed as the lowercase m RPE. Does anyone know what that means? Does anyone know, have an idea what maybe the lowercase am stands for? Good guess. It usually means modified RPE. Because now we ask it, just like the pain scale, on a zero to 10 scale. Does that make a little bit more sense? Like if I was to ask Mark, you know, on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being like you're resting in bed and 10 being like you just ran a marathon, how hard was that activity we just did? Is that a little easier to gauge? Because to me it is, right? Yeah, right. So I can even ask that about these ex these, uh, these lessons, right? On a scale of zero to 10, how hard, how much does your brain hurt after all these exercises? Most of them would be like 11. It's easier to quantify with patients when they're on a scale they already know. Pain is on a zero to 10 scale, right? So it kind of is already in their head and helps them kind of quantify things a little bit better. Usually if we're going on that zero to 10 scale, light is typically from about zero to four. Moderate is somewhere between four and eight. And then eight to 10 is considered heavy. And if you look, there is some overlap there, right? It doesn't exactly stop at this spot. Ideally, when we're working with patients in the clinic, we kind of want them in this scale here. We want them to get a moderate activity going. Oh, do I hear a question popping up? Nope, somebody just signed in. Saw people moving all around. Do you have a question, JT? Nope. He's just playing with his meat button. Now, are there going to be times where we want patients working up in this heavy? Sure. Right? Especially our athletes or maybe somebody that we're going to be doing some cardiac conditioning with. Those patients we may want up in that scale. But the higher we go on this RPE, the more oxygen they're consuming and the harder it is gonna be for some of those patients to breathe. So what type of patient might we avoid that heavy exertion scale with? What do you think? What kind of diagnoses? MS, why MS? Great answer there, Mark, great answer, why MS? And some chronic conditions, we'll cover that, yep. 
Mark had brought up a really good point. Why MS, Mark? What happens if we push those patients up into that 810 level? They're already in pain, okay? That's part of it. It can cause them to get too hot, good, right? And it's gonna send them into a flare, right? So it's gonna trigger the flare. And, and I can speak from experience, it's not fun because that can shut you down for days, right? Heat is what we avoid. It's nothing for somebody that when they have a real severe case of MS, my, my buddy is a really good example of it because he has primary progressive, which never gets better. It just constantly gets worse. When he was going to physical therapy, they pushed him really hard. I remember that he was going to one of the clinics I know back in PA and they pushed him really hard because they're trying to test his cardiac endurance. And it knocked him down for three weeks. It literally basically shut his body down. He wasn't able to do hardly anything for about three weeks because it caused his autoimmune system to just go into a complete flare. So that's a definite one. Certain chronic conditions, we may want to avoid this, right? ALS, um, muscular dystrophy. Why, why might we avoid it with muscular dystrophy? Do you guys know what muscular dystrophy is? Not necessarily nerves. Yeah, muscles can't recover from the damage, right? So what happens in muscular dystrophy? Do you guys know? Because primarily a disabler of young people. It's not necessarily, it is weakness, yes, but what's actually happening to the muscles? Did you guys get to see a picture of that with Dr. Sokal? They may get spastic, good. The muscles themselves, yeah, they degenerate and they turn into adipose. It's actually kind of wild. I'll see if I can find a picture of it. Um, but when muscular dystrophy is in its advanced stages, the muscles literally turn to fat. It's especially when you're talking about Duchenne's. Uh, Becker's is a little different, and um, scapular humeral dystrophy, and a couple of the other ones are a little different. But Duchenne's, for example, is one that definitely, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So, right now with the muscular dystrophy, Mark, is we can help improve the function of our muscles with exercise. You're exactly correct, but we have to watch it. It doesn't slow the process. It just helps the efficiency of the muscles they have. So it's just like before when we're talking about the adaptations, right? We could do isometrics, good, right? And we tend to do those, but again, with kids, isometrics get boring really quick. But we want to avoid this heavy area here of activity because if we get into that heavy area, it actually can cause that muscular dystrophy to speed up. And there was a clinic in town that is no longer in town that one of their things that they got reported for was they'd have kids come in that, that was a pediatric clinic that would be a muscular dystrophy based. And part of their activity was they throw them on the treadmill at a high speed for 15 minutes in order to kind of wear them down. So they were a little bit more compliant in therapy. And the downside to that is that actually makes the muscular dystrophy worse and can speed up the process of it. Now, I understand I've worked with kids with MD before, and they can be a handful. Kids in general are just a handful. Um, how many of you guys want to work with kids? Anyone in here? Nope, nope. Yeah. It can be fun to work with kids. I will say that, but get ready to be bit. I'm just saying. And don't ever turn your back to them. <laughs> they will vanish to bite back. <laughs> Free. Um, and never think that they're weak. Like kids with muscular dystrophy and Down syndrome, you think that they're overall low muscle tone. They can hit pretty hard. Um, they just can. So we want to watch it with kids with muscular dystrophy. We want to watch it with patients that have unstable bone statements, like people with... Um, osteogenesis imperfecta, or an unstable anoccipital joint, such as with um, trisomy 21, I just said it, downs. You gotta be careful with that. So we may avoid that eight to 10. 
What about cardiac patients? Why might we want to avoid that heavy activity with cardiac patients? Yeah, we could, yeah, we could push too much of a cardiac demand on the patient and we stress out the heart, right? Let's just do a quick review here. So I'm going to draw my heart. That's a bad drawing. Let me draw my heart here. So I want red because the heart is always red, right? So here's my heart. It's exactly what it looks like in the human body, right? We have our atrium, we have our ventricle, we have our atrium, we have our ventricle. That's what a heart looks like, right? Jess, that's what you drew it like when you're drawing it for anatomy, right? Totally, yeah. So we have our right side over here. We have our left side over here. Right side, the blood's coming back from the body, right? Body. Left side's coming back from the lungs. Let's think about this logically. With a patient that might have right-sided heart failure, first of all, because I know you covered this with Dr. Sokel, if you have somebody that's got right-sided heart failure, almost all types of heart failure, we're talking about congestive heart failure, they're gonna have backup of fluids. They're gonna have swelling somewhere, right? Or otherwise edema. With right-sided heart failure, where does the swelling occur? A jugular extension, okay. More importantly, kind of where does the swelling happen at? It primarily happens in the periphery, right? The lower extremities, good. Because the fluid's not getting back to the heart, right? Because it's just pooling because that right side of the heart is just not as efficient. Now, what if so, if we have right-sided, it's in the body that we get the edema. What about left-sided? Yeah, pulmonary edema, right? So lungs. And the way I always remember that is left is lung. Left is lung, LL, cool J. Mama said, knock you out. So left-sided edema is, I see I made some of you laugh, right? Left-sided edema is lung. Now, say we're stressing a patient that has right-sided heart failure and we push them to that eight to 10 level. Right now, we do want to get them exercising because we want to get that fluid from the extremities back to the heart where it can get processed out by the kidneys, right? But if they've already got that right sided heart failure and now we push them really hard and are getting in that eight to 10 level of RPE, what's going to happen as that fluid come back, comes back? What's it going to do to the heart? Or what could it do? Yeah, it could flood it. Good. Too much pressure. Right. And then unfortunately, pressure causes things to pop. Right. And they may get something like in it that, where they get super jugular distension, like uh, I think Josh said it earlier, right? Yeah, Josh said it earlier. So we got to watch that. That's where when we have that left that right side of heart failure, we got to watch it because we could return too much fluid to the heart. But we got to have that balance, right? Now let's talk left-sided heart failure. So now left-sided heart failure, we got the patient on the treadmill. <laughs> And they're running at that heat. <laughs> Sorry. I caused myself to go into a coughing pit. Um, uh, we go into that 8 to 10 level with that left-sided heart failure. So now that right side of the heart is working efficiently, right? It's pumping that blood to, that, to the lungs. It's saying, we need more oxygen in the body. Come on, lungs. Come on, lungs. Come on, lungs. Yeah. Swamp lung is a good way to put it. Yeah, they can actually dry drown, right? Because now the lungs start filling up with fluid. Yeah, I was clearing my lungs. Thanks, doctor. <laughs> exactly. So now we start flooding those lungs. Now the left side can't get it out, right? And you can, it's going to cause problems there. So you have to be consciously aware of that when you're working with those patients that are cardiac compromised, right? And then also when you think about it, Let's say you have somebody that's got a heart transplant 
or that's had a um, bypass graft. What are the, what's that surgery called where they get a bypass graft? What's the abbreviation for it? Cabbage, yeah, coronary artery bypass graft. And when you see a cabbage, there's gonna be a number behind it. So it's gonna be like cabbage times one, cabbage times two, cabbage times five. What does that number mean? Does anyone have an idea? I'm uh, sorry, sever what is the severity, but what, what way? That's gonna be the number of arteries that are, have been bypassed. Yeah, the number of grafts. So the higher that number, the more in depth that surgery, right? I am one of the guys I do a podcast with, I, I, I do some back end work on his podcast, just had a cabbage on December 25th. So he had, that was his Christmas gift. He went in for an artery arterial stent and then they're like, nope, straight to the, straight over to the ER, OR, you're getting a coronary artery bypass graft. And you get four of them done. The more that you have, Oh, the greater the risk of that surgery, right? So now let's think about that patient that's got those grafts in the heart and now you push them really hard. Could you cause those grafts to fail? Yeah, especially in that early phase. So you've got to be constantly working with those patients, right? And saying, how does this feel? Do you have to back it down or do you have to increase it, right? It's really important to be paying attention. That means you have to Talk to your patients and ease them into it. Yeah. All right, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, how are you doing today? Right? What you don't want to be doing is one of these. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I know it's hard. And trust me, as a pure introvert, talking to my patients is really difficult for me. But you kind of have to force yourself to do that, right? You have to kind of get away that you're going to start talking to patients. And I openly admit, I have a problem with that. I'm not, I'm not a very loquacious person. Talking to you guys in here helps me with that because I'm forced to do it. So then we talk about efficiency and this goes back down to that whole um, idea of physics, right? When we ever we actually get a work output, that's going to be a force that's generated. The power is how much work we do over how much time. So we can do the same amount of work or the same amount of power if we do for less time or with more power. It's an inverse relationship. So you have to be thinking about that. And what I mean by that is if you shorten the time but keep the load the same, the same amount of work they're doing, the power X, the power output is going to be about the same. Or if you increase that amount of load and decrease that time. So you have to be paying attention when you're working with those patients about how hard you're loading them. So what happens when we do aerobic exercise? 1024. Well, first of all, the first thing that happens is we get some cardiovascular response, right? Exercise gets a pressure response. You get vasoconstriction of vessels and muscles not being used and dilation in muscles being used. Why do you think that happens? Why do you think, like, if you're, and we'll talk about that actually when we get to progression, Josh, but it just depends upon what, so Josh asked, does it, is it better to increase time or resistance first? It's going to depend upon the level of your patient, the, the actual diagnoses, right? Because there are going to be some patients that we don't want to increase resistance, but maybe we want them to work a little harder, so we increase the time. Uh, cardiac patients are a great example of that, especially if they're doing something with their upper extremities, because if you have them doing activities with their upper extremities, closer to the heart, right? If you increase the resistance, that could stress the heart a little faster than maybe the lower extremities. So you have to kind of, this is one of those where it's gonna be dependent upon what your PT's protocol is. And Mark, that can be a good idea to increase time. Um, it just depends upon where your protocols are going and what your goals are for that patient, right? And when I say your goals, I'm not talking that you're setting the goals. I'm talking your goals as in the PT goals for the patient. 
right? If their goal is to increase endurance, yeah, we want to increase that time. If our goal is to overall increase power, it may not be necessarily a beneficial to push them in time. We may want to push the level of work that they're doing. So it's kind of a balancing act is the best way I can put it. But great questions. So with vessels, let's say I'm going running and I get up and I start running and I'm using my arms for arm swing and I'm using my legs, obviously for running. Why would maybe the blood vessels in my upper back maybe start constricting a little bit while the vessels in my legs and my arms are opening up more? Why would we get constriction in some places and dilation in others? What's the body doing at that point? Yeah, the body's determining the circulation of where that blood needs to go. It's efficiency, right? It's the same idea with that fight or flight response. You know, let's say that Stephanie is, you know, at the mall and she's going back to the dressing room to try this beautiful dress on and she opens the dressing room door to go in and try it. And in that door stands Michael Myers and he's got a knife, right? All of a sudden the fight or flight response is going to kick in. And unlike in the movies, I'm doubting that she's just gonna freeze. She's probably gonna take off running. Somewhere during that run, she may vomit because the body's gonna say, I don't need to provide blood flow to my stomach right now. It is more important for me to survive. So the body is really good at kind of shunting blood flow to where it's needed, right? So it just depends upon what we're dealing with, right? If we're doing a lot of curls, you're doing a lot of swole bro curls, your legs may not get as much blood flow. And so it just depends on what's going on. You'll get some constriction in some areas and blood flow in others. The heart itself, as they start exercising, will become more and more efficient, as long as the heart is efficient to start with. Now, there, you know, if you already have some cardiac problems, does working and exercising improve that cardiac output? Sure, it does. But if the heart is already damaged, it may not automatically reverse that damage. In the periphery, the resistance at those peripheral, um, what are those things called? Capillaries, there we go. At the capillaries, the peripheral resistance decreases. That means that blood is easier to enter the cells wherever it is, right? That's gonna increase our cardiac output. It will increase our systolic blood pressure. What about diastolic? Is diastolic gonna go up a lot when we're exercising? No, good. Why? What is diastolic? Do you remember that from anatomy? Yeah, it's the rest pressure. Good. And if that diastolic, so here's our beautiful, let me draw my little artery here. I know I'm, here's our beautiful artery, right? So diastolic is when the vessel looks like this, right? When it's at rest. Systolic. is when that blood vessel goes from here to here, right? When it pumps that blood down. So it, when it expands and then contracts, that's what our systolic blood pressure is. That's kind of the way that blood vessel works. Now, I should, just should have raised it all. What would it mean if our diastolic blood pressure increases, what could that mean about those blood vessels? Could mean they're blocked, good, right? There could be some blockages. Or hardened, yeah. What's that called when those arteries harden? What's the word for artery again? Not angio, that's blood vessel. Arteriosclerosis, there we go, right? So we get arteriosclerosis, the hardening of our arteries, right? So, so the arteries themselves become thicker and kind of fatter and they're not able to stay at rest pressure as much they're starting to squeeze even at rest. Yeah, you're gonna lose five points for spelling, I'll give you that. 
And then remember, as those arteries harden, because they're not expanding as much because they're hardening, what starts happening inside the vessel, as Josh mentioned? Yeah, build up. And they start getting more narrow. So that lumen, the space they're able to push blood through is gonna decrease, which is gonna further increase that blood pressure, right? Especially when it pumps, because now that blood pressure when it pumps has to fight through those clogs. And you get that atherosclerosis, where you get buildup on top of the hardening. Good job, guys, see? Take a break in just a few minutes here. So respiratory response. When you first exer start exercising, what happens to your breathing? What happens to your respiratory rate? When you first start exercising? Yeah, it starts to increase, right? And I think we've all experienced this, right? You get on the treadmill and you start you know, ch chugging along on the treadmill. <sighs> and then eventually what happens to your respiratory rate as you're on it longer and longer? Well, it may start to regulate, good, right? It will increase if you keep bumping that level up, right? Mark, if you, if you keep going, okay, I'm at six miles per hour, I'm at seven miles per hour, if you keep bumping up, yeah, you're gonna increase. But eventually you're gonna regulate, hopefully, as long as you have kind of normal function system. And why is it increasing in both, you know, the efficiency as well as the amount that we're breathing in? Well, it's gotta increase the blood flow. So it's gotta, as the blood flow increases, oxygen rates gotta increase. So we have a higher demand. Overall, the lungs have two things happen in the lungs. Number one, the lungs start consuming more of the oxygen we're taking in. So most of the oxygen we take in is about air we've taken is about 40% oxygen. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we take that 40% oxygen, we use about, I, I think it's like 7% of the oxygen we take in or seven to 10%. I forget what it is. Don't quote me on that, please. I'm not a... I'm not the best at reading that. But as we take that oxygen in, and now we're starting to exercise, we start extracting more of that oxygen. The other downside to that is, is as we breathe out, we're breathing out more and more carbon dioxide. So we've got to breathe equally as we're doing that. What type of patient, if you're exercising them, might increase their carbon dioxide hold levels in their lungs? So we might have to focus on their breathing while we're exercising them. What major class, what major disease? Yeah, COPD, yeah, right? So we really gotta hit those patients that have lung problems. Could be COPD, could be lung cancer as well, right, Ashley? So we have to kind of think about that and go, okay, we gotta focus on breathing. And you've all seen this at the gym, right? Somebody goes over to do, you know, they're doing preacher curls over the thing, right? They're and they just hold their breath the whole time. Hold on a second. <laughs> just made myself light at it just by doing that, right? I turned, I even turned red, look at that, that's great. So they get that Valsalva, which we're gonna talk about, but the main thing is they're not breathing. And if they're not breathing, oxygen exchange isn't occurring and you're starting to build up that carbon dioxide in your lungs. So that oxygen exchange has to occur. When we're testing these patients, there are all kinds of physical tests we can do. For low level patients, we can do something like a six minute walk test, right? For higher level patients, there are all kinds of things we can do VO2 max tests. There's all kinds of them out there. But if you've got a heart patient, a lot of times you're gonna be hearing about this thing called a stress test. Has anyone heard of this before? Your patient goes in for a stress test, right? There are two main top types of stress test. There's this little six minute cardiac one where they put you on the treadmill and your goal is to increase your heart rate naturally, right? And then they can inject you with ADP, adenosine, Right, so in the patient that may not be able to get on the treadmill and go for six to 18 minutes, and usually there's a couple stages of about six minutes that you're doing with those patients. 
they'll say, okay, a patient can't do that. Instead, we're going to artificially make the heart work faster. And so they inject them with the denosine. And I can speak from experience, that doesn't feel good. Just imagine that your heart goes from ah, nice resting, I'm okay, I'm laying on this mat, to holy crap, Jason, Michael Myers, and Freddie are all chasing me at the same moment, and I'm tied down to this bed. That's literally what it feels like when your heart goes crazy like that. It just shoots up. Like I was watching, I watched my heart rate go from like 60 to 170 in a minute. Yeah, some good stuff. And you're not allowed to move, you just kind of sit there while they check your heart output, right? So they're looking at stress test to look at the workload and establish a baseline of the heart. How is the heart working? We're looking, is there any dysfunction in the heart? They may be doing imaging while you're on the stress test. So they may have you get on this treadmill and run for six minutes and then take you right over and do an image of your heart, maybe an ultrasound or an arteriogram or something like that. When a patient is having a stress test, there are times where PT will be involved with the stress test. I have been involved in the hospital setting for that. And the main reason I'm usually there, they bring one of us down is safety. You know, the doc is gonna lead the whole stress test or the, the cardiac nurse, whoever's in charge of the stress test. Our job is mainly there so that the patient doesn't fall. Catch and release, pretty much. You're exactly right, Mark. But just like any patient we work with, what should these patients on the stress test have on them? Yes, A, B, G, B. Always be gate building. Always be gate building. And why is that? Because it's not a matter of if your patient will fall, it's a matter of when. And it's usually your most healthy star pupil patient that's gonna end up falling on you because you're not paying attention, you need to put a gate belt on them. You're like, oh, well, they're fine. They've been, they've been seeing me for two weeks now. They, they haven't tripped, they haven't fallen, they're good. You don't need a gate belt, Stephanie. I've been working with you forever. And all of a sudden I lose my attention for five seconds and Stephanie goes down. So always be gate battling, right? These patients are gonna be given a physical by the primary care or the cardiac doc to be hooked up with an EKG, right? What happens if you knock off one of their leads in physical therapy? Are they gonna die? You may have to start over, right? Yeah, the stress test is no joke, Mark. They mark max you out pretty quick. You're 100% correct, right? Just because you knock off an EKG or an ECG, I keep calling them EKG, I got it used to the ECG term. Just because you knock off an ECG lead, it's not going to kill them. Don't worry. It's just going to send the ECG into a fit. So just be aware of that. ECG is not going to kill them. There are some other leads you can knock off them. There are things you can knock off that could. But they also have to have consent. The patient really needs to understand what they're doing for this stress test. So what we're looking for, why might we stop the, the stress test? If heart pain gets worse, if there's a significant drop, and I've seen this with patients where their heart rate starts going up, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're up in the 100s, 110s, and then suddenly the heart rate drops down to like 40, 50. Not a good sign. Syncope, what's syncope? Yeah, unable to breathe, good, right? What's syncope? That's not unable to breathe, what is syncope? Yeah, ooh, that's what just happened to me a few seconds ago, right? I was like, ooh, I see colors. It's only worrisome if you can taste the colors. If you see them, you're okay. If you can taste them, that's the problem. Tastes like Crayola. Any type of ECG abnormalities that are negative. So you start seeing V-fib, A-fib, something like that. Or if the subject decides to quit. And I'll be honest, most times if they're getting an e uh, this stress test, if the patient's like, no, I don't want to do this anymore, most time that doc or that nurse that's doing it is not necessarily always going to listen to them. 
they're going to try to push them to continue and go through it. Um, but, <coughs> excuse me, the, the patient needs to get this done because, and this is kind of our job to cajole a little bit and work them through it is, if they don't get the stress test done today, they're going to have to do it tomorrow. If they don't get it done tomorrow, they're going to have to do it the next day. So it's better just to knock it out. And I, I'm guessing that Mark's had a stress test with the fact that he said it's a no joke. They're not fun, right? But the, once they're done, they're done, usually. It's not like you're going to have to do them five times over. All right, so let's take a break here. Let me stop sharing. It's about 40 after. Pause, share. Resuming recording, now getting back to exercise program. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about this. When we talked about you know, how do we know what to do? Well, the frequency itself, how often they need to exercise is going to depend upon the individual and their condition and their goals, right? Also, I guess we should add that on there at the end as well, is that their goals are also going to be how much they should exercise depending upon where our goals are. When we talk about intensity, there are a couple of principles we're going to hit on this slide and also the next slide. Excuse me. The uh, first principle is the overload principle. For training to occur, load must exceed training stimulus threshold. She uses hydrogen peroxide to sanitize her shoes, not human tissue. Exactly, Dr. A. So what does this say? The overload principle says, if you're going to get gains, you have to do more than you're already doing. Right? Now, the good news for me, I'm just going to use myself as a great example. When I go back to the gym, the only thing I'm going to get is gains because I haven't been going to the gym for a while. <laughs> um, but if you're going to the gym and, you know, you're doing it regularly, like I, before, be, before BC, before COVID, I was doing anywhere between 300 and 400 push-ups a day. I wasn't getting massive from doing those. Why? Because my body had adapted to doing that many push-ups a day. You know, now I'm lucky if I get like 50. But in order to train, your load has to simulate that threshold, right? And just, oh, that should be cardio. There's a spelling. I just lost five points, Mark. Just remember that individuals at risk or patients with cardio compromised conditions, we have to be aware of that. We have to look at the variables. The higher the intensity, the longer the intervals, the faster training occurs. And yes, exactly just as there has to be a progressive overload. You can't just say like all of a sudden, I'm going to bench press 900 pounds. I'm going to get gains. You'll be sitting there with that bench press on your chest going, somebody help me, please. Specificity principle comes into play here as well. Train for what you're training for, right? <clears throat> endurance won't make dramatic improvements in power. Power won't make dramatic improvements in endurance, right? It's just like if you want to get better at basketball, you don't go play badminton. There will be some transfer of technique and some transfer of skills, right? You mimic the sport you want in, right? Good, right? Um, for example, and I'm going to use myself as an example here. I am, I, uh, I am getting ready to participate in, well, not right now, but I was before this. I was getting ready in late March. There's a, and that's not sport wise, but we're going to call it a sport. There's an e-sport coming up. There's a uh, Madden tournament I'm going to be participating in. Madden is a video game, by the way, Dr. Reskin. Just joking. There's a Madden tournament coming up in, uh, I think it's like April or March anyway. And I was, um, I was invited to participate in, I haven't played Madden in forever, but I was invited to participate with a couple of the guys I know. I think they just want to take my money, but that's beside the point. So I can play all of the Call of Duty I want. I'm not going to get good at Madden necessarily playing Call of Duty. That's looking at the video game level, right? How am I going to get better at teaching? Well, the only way I'm going to get better at teaching is by teaching, right? How am I going to get better at dodgeball? I'm going to dodge wrenches because if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. We learned that, right? So the greater the intensity, the shorter the duration needed generally, right? So 20 to 30 minutes for at a 70% target heart rate, 45 minutes for less than that. 
So what is this idea of target heart rate? So a target heart rate is where you want to hit, right? That's target heart rate says, what heart rate do I want to hit? I think the lame is just came on on my uh, Spotify. I can hear it in the background. So does anyone know what your max heart rate is? What's the max heart rate you should eat? You should try to avoid going over, yeah, 220 minus the age. Good, Jess, right? So 220 minus your age. So for me, that's 220 minus 110. So that means I can't go over 110 beats per minute. I'm joking, I'm not 110. But let's think about this for a second here. So max heart rate is 220 minus the age. Let's say we've got somebody that's 90 years old, right? So we subtract that out and their heart rate max is 130. How hard is it to get somebody up to the 130s? Is it really that difficult? In general? No, it's really not that difficult to get them there. And honestly, when you have somebody that's 90 years old, a lot of times their resting heart rate already is high. So her rest, you know, this, let's call it a little Millie here, right? Millie, who's 90. That's a Y. I can't write today. If her resting heart rate is already like 93, we don't have a large range there, right? So when we talk about a target heart rate, what the target heart rate is going to be is whatever percentage you want times your max heart rate. So for Millie here, let's say that the doctor wants her exercising at 50% or get, get her to a 50% target heart rate. Times that times her max heart rate, oh, oh, we're in trouble because that's 65 beats per minute, right? Yeah. She's already at 93, she just has to sit there. She doesn't have to exercise. <clears throat> so there is a long formula we're gonna do with the aerobic comp called the Kevorian target heart rate that takes into account your max heart rate. And that's designed for patients that already have cardiac compromised conditions that takes into account your resting heart rate in order to calculate what would be a safe heart rate for you to exercise at. So we'll go over that, we have a lab for that. So we'll talk about that in that lab. But we have to understand that, you know, some patients with their max heart rate, they're pretty close already to what a lot of times their target heart rates are. So we have to be aware of that. I knew that was a bad one. So when we're exercising the patient, we also have to think about the reversibility principle. And what that says is that detraining occurs much more rapidly than the process of training somebody. And oh boy, do I feel that right now. Bed rest is the greatest killer to any training regimen, right? So even with an injury, maintaining a modicum of training can reduce the detraining effects. Let's say you, um, you know, tomorrow, Jess is out there and accidentally tears her ACL. I'm not, I'll just pick on you because you're up there and I haven't picked on you yet today, Jess. Overall, her overall training regimen is going to start to decline because she's injured herself. Well, if I talk about it, it doesn't happen. That's the way I look at it. So our overall training regimen is going to decline. If she at least does something back to Billy here. Yeah. If she at least does something, it can help slow down that detraining effect, right? If she does something as simple as walking, doing some isometric activities, doing some range of motion, right? I'm coming for you if it does. Try to find me, try to find me. Actually, I don't doubt that she probably would find me. Please don't come find me. So when we're talking about these things, we talk about what we're working for. Are we working for strength, power, or endurance, or are we working for all three? 
right? Strength is the greatest measurable force that can be exerted by a muscle group. It helps to control a load. In PT, we use a lot of strength training, right? How do we measure strength in a patient? What did we just talk about yesterday? MMT, good, right? This is our, this is when we measure MMT, the grades, right? And that's one of our kind of tested measures we run through. Power is that force over a distance, over a time, the rate of performing work, right? Power training cannot be developed without first developing strength. <clears throat> that kind of makes sense. You can't carry a load unless you have the strength to lift that load, right? It's not like you could pick up, you know, a, you know, a, like those power lifters. <clears throat> you can't pull a tractor trailer truck across a parking lot unless you can already move the weight of that tractor trailer truck. So you have to have some strength there before you can even have power. And those guys are crazy, right? I just, it's insane to see them do stuff like that. And then endurance training is performing those activities over and over and over again. That deals with the cardiovascular system. Not everyone is going to have the best endurance, the best strength or the best power. We all tend towards one of those or trend towards, right? We all, and you probably can think about it yourself that maybe you're really strong. You know, I think I, I, I tend towards that is that I'm able to do something once really well, usually. You know, I'm able to lift pretty heavy loads very infrequently. You know, my strength is really good, my power is maybe not the best and my endurance is probably not the best. But then you look at somebody like a cross-country runner or a long-distance runner, their endurance is there, but they may not drop loads frequently exactly. That's after I've lifted at least once, Mark. Give me at least a look at it. Right? They don't, they don't ring the lunk alarm on me too much at uh, Planet Fitness. So that overload principle we talked about is to improve muscle performance, we must overload the muscle's capability. So if you're at the gym and you're you bench press 100 pounds every single day. Eventually, your muscles will adapt to that, right? And that becomes the muscle's capability. In order to further build and hypertrophy your muscles, you're going to have to gradually increase that over time. So maybe next week, you lift 110. And then the next week, you lift 115. And then the next week, you lift 120. That is the idea of that overload principles where you slowly, steadily increase that weight. If you increase it too much, you can get muscle failure. So you have to be paying attention when you're working with your patients and watch their overall function, right? <coughs> Excuse me. What could be a sign that you're overloading the patients too much in the clinic? What would be a, what? Okay, regression, good, right? They starting to get no progression at all, fatigue. Or like Mark said, they're dropping the weights, right? Their pallor is going off. You're overloading that patient at that point. You need to kind of reassess what you're making them do. And, I, and for me, when I talk about that, a lot of times for me, the, the problem I have with that is when I get, if I do train an athlete, I tend to train them a little harder than I, I, I just don't think about the fact that, oh, they're an athlete. I've got to, if they're injured, I've got to slow them down even a little bit. So you've got to pay attention to that as well. That said principle, the specific adaptation of imposed demands. If you're going for one type of activity, you should do that activity. There is some carryover from doing other activities, right? There's some transfer of training. But if you want to get better at one thing, you've got to do that one thing. If you want to be, you know, the world's best bench presser, you've got to bench press. If you want to be the world's best student, you've got to learn to study. And then the reverse ability principle we talked about there, transit unless continu training continues. And there is this kind of principle that once you've gotten trained, it takes a little bit less to maintain that training than it does to gain training. So once you've already kind of got those gains, it doesn't take as much to keep those gains there. But the minute you slack off, those gains will start dropping. So you gotta be paying attention to that. 
so acti <coughs> excuse me, activity recommendations. From the Surgeon General, from the CDC, Academy of Health and whatever, blah, 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 the HA, the ACSM, pretty much they say that the children from ages 6 to 17 should get 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise. What does QD mean? We don't use that term anymore, so don't use that. I don't know why I still have that in my sheet. What does QD mean? Yeah, day, once daily. Yeah, we're not supposed to use that anymore. I don't know why I still have that on there. Let's change that. Another five points off my thing. Parents, this 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity can make your life a little bit better too. Because this can wear your kid down a little bit and maybe even help them sleep a little better at night. Right? There's a lot of studies, at least in the psych, so in the psych world, that show that doing this activity, this 60 minutes a day for kids, has a twofold effect. Number one, it helps the kids sleep better at night. And if the kids sleep better at night, that encoding of everything they've learned for the day gets encoded better. So there's some benefits to not only physicality by doing these exercise, doing exercise 60 minutes a day, but also to cognition. Um, the NFL started that play 60 program, which is actually kind of cool where they're trying to get people working out, you know, kids working out 60 minutes a day, getting them out and running. <clears throat> My mom used to do that to me, except it was not play 60. It was more like play eight hours. When I grew up, it was, you know, the sun came up, go outside, don't come back till the street lights come on. Find something to do, kid. But at least go out and uh, go get lost, yeah. Or at least go out, my mom's other phrase was, go blow the stink off yourself. Go run around a little bit. So getting that moderate exercise is really good for them. Adults from 65 to, or 18 to 65, they should have 30 minutes of moderate exercise five days a week or 20 minutes of vigorous exercise three days a week. So at minimum, and again, these are kind of the minimums you want to go for. So you should be doing about 30 minutes of kind of moderate exercise five days a week. Most of us are looking at that going, well, I can't exercise five days a week. Well, that just means we have to up our intensity level. Uh, the who's I think are actually higher than this, actually, Stephanie, I have to check. I don't remember off the top of my head. This is from the, this is mainly from the Surgeon General. Yeah, this is, these are for, these are uh, for Americans. Um, let's just go with that. We got to start small here, Stephanie. We got to start small. Baby steps, baby steps, Bob, baby steps. Adults 65 and older, they should do 30 minutes. I'm a here, you're not wrong. Adults 65 or older should do 30 minutes of moderate exercise five days a week or 20 minutes of vigorous exercise three days a week. Look at that. Basically, anyone that's 18 or older should be doing about the same stuff. Now, if you have chronic health conditions, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing exercise. All it means is you have to monitor it and maybe seek the help of a healthcare professional in what your requirements are based upon your condition. Just because you have the, 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 the sug and you have diabetes doesn't mean you shouldn't be getting 30 minutes of moderate exercise a week or a day for five days. It just means that you have to understand how that exercise is gonna affect you and that would be a good time to see, oh, wait, what are those, what are those people called that are healthcare professionals that, you know, are responsible for helping us with physical activity? Oh, yeah, physical therapists, right? And PTAs, right? That's where they should come see us and say, hey, I've got diabetes and I need to figure out what's best for me. <clears throat> So it's typically, so usually RP is going to go with heart rate, Josh. Um, but ideally, I think by the Surgeon General, they go by RPE. Don't quote me on that. It's actually a really good question. I'm going to write that down to look up. I'll see what, they what they're considering moderate. I'm pretty confident they're actually considering it on like the RPE scale that they consider in that four to six range if you're talking about the modified RPE. You do have to be aware that 
with age differences, cardiac activity responds differently, right? Children's hearts, young adults and old adults, their hearts respond differently, right? Kids automatically, right? Kids automatically have a faster heart rate to begin with, right? They're automatically kind of running around like little monkey midgets on speed, right? They're already kind of running around doing stuff like that. Their heart rate is automatically faster because their bodies are growing. And as we get older, our heart rate kind of levels out. And so we have to be aware that as we get older, the heart doesn't respond as well because the heart is getting older too. The heart only has so many beats. So the heart rate's gonna change. Your stroke volume and cardiac output are going to change. <clears throat> so what is stroke volume again? Do you remember that from anatomy? What is that stroke volume? So it relates to cardiac heart put and heart rate, right? Yeah. So stroke volume is kind of the amount of blood pushed, right? And cardiac output then is how much of the heart, how much of the blood that comes into the heart actually goes back out again, right? And that's usually a percentage. So how much that blood that comes in goes back out again. So stroke volume is how much blood that heart is actually physically pushing around. And that cardiac output is how much that comes in and goes back out. Because not all of it does, because the heart uses some of it. And the lungs use some of it. And the organs use some of it, right? So arterial venous oxygen difference. There is a difference in the way that both kids, young adults, and older adults are able to exchange gases. As we get older, that exchange of gas is not as efficient. The maximum oxygen uptake is also different as we get older. It's, we're not able to cardiac train and endurance train as well as we are as we get older. Now, some people are those magical out people that can keep their endurance training all the way till they're 90, but most of us aren't. Blood pressure, as we get older, typically our blood pressure will go up, specifically our systolic. Diastolic usually doesn't change with age, unless we have, you know, other compromising problems as well, or co comorbid problems. Respiration rate stays the same through most of us. Kids do have a little bit faster of a respirate initially. So that means they're already breathing faster at rest. And then as we get older, that levels out. Muscle mass and strength, we'll talk about that in train, strength training with kids and adults in a little bit. And then anaerobic ability. <clears throat> this seems to be inversely proportional to age is that kids usually don't have as much anaerobic ability as we have when we get to kind of like middle age, that young adult age, and then moving on. And then that declines as well. So we kind of have that peak with our anaerobic. We're not as high as when we're younger, it peaks, and then it gets worse. Like a lot of things in our life, unfortunately, once you kind of get over that 40 year old hump, things kind of go downhill. So when we're building an exercise program, they have to have a warm up. Right? It's usually total body movement that should bring the person within 20 beats of their target heart rate. Right? So what are some exercises we can have them do to warm up? What kind of stuff can we have them do? And don't say hot pack. Because hot pack doesn't help. It warms up the localized area. What kind of stuff can we make them do that'll warm them up? Okay, walking, good. Something as simple as walking can work upper body ergometer, the bike, the treadmill. We can have them do jumping jacks if they're able to, right? Anything to kind of bring that heart rate up. Dynamic stretches where they're getting some activity and with the stretching, good. And then if they're doing aerobic exercise periods, we wanna warm up, bring that heart rate up, and then they're gonna start exercising. And there are a couple different theories or techniques with doing aerobic exercise. We can do continuous exercise or continuous training where they just stay below that maximum level, sub-max training for longer periods of time. That's going to help build up that endurance. Then we have the interval training. Interval training's been all the rage of late, right? Interval training's where you get that peak, rest, peak, rest, peak, rest, whereas with this sub-max, you're kind of just going at a level. 
Circuit training is a little bit of submax energy levels with various equipment, typically aerobic and anaerobic, meaning maybe some weights along with some treadmill, along with maybe the, the elliptical. And then circuit interval combines both of those. So circuit intervals where we're keeping that high rate, low rate, high rate, low rate, but we interchange between equipment as we're doing that. There's not a one of these is better method, right? It's all going to depend upon the person. Some people do really well with continuous training. Some people get bored at that and it doesn't do them all. So maybe they need the interval training or maybe they need the circuit training. It's going to depend upon the patient and what the PT's goals are for that patient. After that aerobic activity, we should have a cool down period, right? Usually again, if you're warming up as maybe on the treadmill, you might want to cool down a little bit on the treadmill as well. So slow down and do some walking on the treadmill. You might want to do some stretching. Yoga is a great way to kind of cool down and relax the body after activity. I shall I hear? I don't know. I'm not that flexible. Yoga is kind of antithetical to everything I do because I would probably fall. So cool down is a really good method to kind of relax. The other thing that cool down does, it can help us offset that DOMS effect that can come in. So according to your book in box 7.9, in order to establish an aerobic training program, we have to establish the heart rate, warm them up, increase that pace of the activity so the heart rate can be maintained for 20 to 30 minutes and then cool them down. That aerobic activity should be undertaken three to five times a week based upon the level we're doing. To avoid injuries, the patient should use appropriate equipment such as proper footwear, proper biomechanical support. Avoid running or jogging or aerobic dancing on hard surfaces such as asphalt or concrete. And I don't know about you guys, but like when I go to something like Costco or um, what's the other one, Sam's Club, when I walk around that for a little while, even just walking on that concrete for a long period of time, my body doesn't feel the best. I can't imagine what it's like for some of those employees that work there on a regular, right? So th that, that surface is not exactly the most conducive to keeping yourself from being injured because it's just hard concrete. Um, so that means maybe not running on, you know, running on, I've seen the where running on sidewalks isn't exactly great. Yeah, walking on concrete all day hurts, exactly. Avoid overuse interim and structures of the musculoskeletal system by proper warm up, stretching, and then also maintain that cool down, right? Overuse commonly occurs when there's an increase in time or effort without adequate rest between sessions. That means when you're doing activities, there needs to be not only rest after your activity, but there also has to become some rest between activities. You don't wanna necessarily really, really stress out your activity doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. If you do curls every day and you're constantly pushing those curls to your max level, you're going to eventually kind of overload and cause an overuse syndrome to occur. You get maybe something like tenovitis or tenosynovitis where your muscles just aren't handling it very well and then breakdown is imminent. Exactly. The other thing is to individualize the program of exercise. All people are not the same. We can't just take out one blanket exercise program and say this works for everybody. Although um, each body training would say that every exercise program is perfect for everybody, right? Just go do the, uh, I don't know what their current one is. There's like, like 50,000 different ones that they have. But this exercise program is perfect for people of all levels, you know, uh, here's P90X. It's going to be great for everybody. And then the first time you do it, you're like, I don't like this. This is not fun. Exercise has to be individualized to the person, right? Begin at a safe level and then progress as the patient meets goals. It's just like anything else. What happens as we train? Well, cardiovascular, our stroke volume goes up. As our stroke volume goes up, our cardiac output goes up with it, and then oxygen permeability at the muscular level increases. Our lung volume increases, right? The ability for the lungs to expand and hold more oxygen increases. 
They're also more efficient, meaning that exchange at the alveoli becomes a lot better. Mitochondrial proliferation increases, right? Those mighty mitochondria out of their cell levels, meaning they're able to use ATP a lot more efficiently. Therefore, your overall metabolic usage gets better. With exercise also in training, your body fat percentages do tend to go down. Your bad cholesterol levels, and I'm using bad in quotes because there's bad and a good cholesterol, right? Tends to go down. You usually have improved thermal regulation, meaning you, know, you adapt a lot better to changes in temperature. And you have improved musculoskeletal resistance. Your ability to avoid getting hurt gets a lot better. So there's a ton of benefits that work and happen with training, right? When we look at aerobic training conditioning programs, especially for patients with coronary disease, we typically talk about there being three primary phases. So there's gonna be an inpatient phase, there's gonna be an outpatient phase one, or phase, technically it's a phase two of the program, but outpatient phase one, outpatient phase two, which is phase three of the program. The inpatient phase for coronary disease or heart disease, right, will start three to five days after the insult. So this is the patient has a heart attack and they're in the hospital. Typically, they're not gonna be seeing PT for three to five days. Now that, love, that day range has shrunk of late. The doctors tend to want the patients up and moving more, free, <clears throat> more recently than just three to five days. But it's also gonna depend upon what happened with that coronary insult. If they've had to have a cabbage, it may be a little while till they're able to get up and get out of bed. Right. They may be in the ICU for days. Doesn't mean we can't see them, but the docs will determine when that patient is specifically ready to be seen by the PT. At about that three to five day level, we're going to start working on some ADL based activities, getting dressed, getting out of bed, maybe getting a shower with OT, brushing your teeth, those type of things. But we're not going to do any resistive training in that inpatient level. So while they're in that inpatient level, that should not be a time where we're giving them 25 pound dumbbells and having them do curls, right? That's where we're gonna work on a lot lighter level stuff, maybe some isometrics, as long as we're talking submax isos. We're not gonna be pushing them super hard. You know, six to eight weeks after insult, they should be definitely out of the hospital at that point. They've probably had some home health as well. And now they should be coming to an outpatient physical therapy clinic. It really does benefit. And a lot of the research with the cardiac specialized silo of the PTA shows that patients that go to outpatient therapy after a cardiac insult do have better life outcomes as long as they're receiving that therapy. And not only that, but the insurance company should see that because if they're going to outpatient therapy, there's less likelihood of them going back in for another cardiac insult if they're getting exercise. In that phase two, or that first phase of outpatient, they should be primarily doing aerobic exercise. So they should be doing stuff to build up that cardiovascular endurance, at least back to where they were before the insult. We can start to add some weight training in there, but we have to be careful. And when we are adding weight training with the cardiac patient, we have a preference that we're gonna work lower extremities more than upper extremities. And there's a reason for that. The upper extremities are closer to the heart. They're gonna stress the heart a little bit more than your lower extremities. And then once we get to that kind of outpatient phase two or the phase three of the cardiac rehab, that's gonna be lifelong, right? The monitoring period is gonna be for the rest of their life with that heart condition they have. They wanna to try to return to that prior level, but they may not be able to get there. And so at that point we have to compensate. And again, it goes back to what I told you, our job in physical therapy, safety first, right? Return to function second. And if I can't return them to function, compensate. Those are kind of our big kind of overarching goals of physical therapy. So we're going to try to compensate them for a loss if they've got that. And again, here, special consideration, cardiac patients complete 35% less work with upper extremities 
than lower extremities before symptoms occur. So that means if they're doing upper extremities versus lower extremities, it takes a lot less of that upper extremity work to trigger a symptom than it does for the lower extremities. And overall, adaptive changes will slowly occur with them. They will slowly get a little bit better. But understand if they've got a severe cardiac insult, it's gonna take some time. This is not a, you know, I go in, I have a cardiac artery bypass graft and tomorrow I'm better. It's gonna, this is gonna be a lifelong process for most of these patients after that. It's gonna involve diet change. It's gonna involve activity changes. It's gonna involve a lot of life changes too. Because if you're working at a high stress job, it's not gonna be long till you're back in there with another cardiac insult. For patients with deconditioned or patients with chronic illnesses, we're gonna try to slow and reverse that deconditioning if we can. Now a patient that might have something like ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, right? The best we can hope there, because we're not going to be able to reverse that deconditioning, but the best we can hope there is maybe slow the progression. We're going to look at adaptations for participation restrictions. How can we help them do more of their ADLs and IADLs with less energy output, right? We're going to talk about over here again with the compensation, energy conservation. How can we help them do things and use less energy so they're able to do more things? Help them understand their activity restrictions and then help them again, minimize that decondition. Their impairments, their goals and their plan of care all need to be based upon what their conditions are. A patient that has MS is not gonna be the same as a patient that has ALS, that has muscular dystrophy, that has, myasthenia gravis. We have to tailor their programs based upon what their conditions are. The PT has to also involve the patient in those goal settings, right? And our job then, once the goals are set and once our plan of care is set up, is to implement that plan of care and help that patient understand why we're going where we're going so that they can get a buy-in and we can get better function from the patient. What can influence tension generation or strength generation in the normal skeletal muscle? Well, how much energy you have and what's your blood supply? If you're dehydrated, you're not able to generate as much force through your muscles because they're not able to get as much blood supply. If you don't have a ton of energy, like right now for me, I don't have a ton of energy. Pretty much after this class, I'm probably gonna crash for at least 30 minutes. I don't have a ton of energy reserves. And so when I'm doing stuff like <clears throat> right now, it wears me out really quickly. Muscle fatigue and overall general fatigue is there as well, right? And we have to understand the thresholds fatigue. The more and more you understand what your own personal thresholds to hit fatigue are, the more you can start identifying what are factors that trigger that fatigue. And then as PTs and PTAs, we can come in and help them with energy conservation techniques to kind of skirt around those thresholds and maybe lessen their overall general fatigue. How long does it take you to recover from exercise is gonna influence how much strength you can generate, right? When you have early childhood and pre-adolescence, they don't have as much functional strength or ability to generate tension in those muscles as somebody that's entering that adolescent period when they start hitting hormones. And then when you start hitting into adulthood and late adulthood, those hormones start slowing down again and you're not able to generate as much. Some other things that can affect it is psychological cognitive factors. If you're not able to pay attention to what you're doing, you may not be able to do as much activity. And then motivation and feedback are kind of big. I find that you know, as much as extrinsic feedback is useful, when somebody says to you, oh, you're doing great, blah, 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 there also has to be a certain amount of intrinsic feedback to boost your motivation. There has to be a reason why you're doing the programs you're doing. If you don't have that reason why, you're not gonna stick to them. So when we start adding resistive exercise in, now, after we've gotten some of the cardio training, now we're starting to add some resistive stuff in. We have to think of the alignment and stabilization, right? Looking at the way the muscles work, getting them in a position 
where this pull of the activity they're doing is in line with the pull of the muscle. And then also look at stabilization. What can we do to help them with stabilization or what do their stabilizers look like and do we have to strengthen those as well? When we talk about submax versus maximal exercise loads, we have to determine, are we going to be pushing them just under their total level? Or are we gonna be pushing them to where they totally hit total muscle fatigue? We're gonna initialize exercise loads and document it. So we're gonna keep looking at what those repetitions do. What happens as we progress to repetitions? What is the outcome of doing it? There are all kinds of alternative methods for determining baseline strength. For us, it's mainly manual muscle testing is what we're gonna do. And then keeping in that training zone. So with physical therapy, a lot of times when we're doing strength training, the big thing you're gonna see are sets and reps, right? How many sets of how many reps is a patient doing? So are they doing three sets? Typically, and for those of you that are techs, you probably can agree with this. You may say, or actually not three sets, I'm sorry, that's a lot. Three sets of 10 is the big one I always see in the clinic. And if you ask anyone why three sets of 10, no one really tells you. It's kind of like ultrasound at 1.8 watts per centimeter squared. No one really knows why we picked that. We just picked it. And it kind of becomes one of those things, right? So a lot of times we're going to have that sets and reps out there. And then like we had asked earlier is, well, what do we increase first, Mr. McKeever? Do we increase sets? We do increase reps. Do we increase time? Yes. That's my answer to that. It's going to determine based on your patient's overall. Yes, no, exactly, Mark. That your favorite phrase. Yes, no. It's going to be based upon what your goals are by your PT, what the plan of care is established to do, and then also what the goals for the patient are. You know, if the PT's plan of care does not include any progression, there's probably a reason for that. And that means we stick to what that plan of care is. There are sometimes reasons why we don't progress exercises. There may be a medical restriction in place, or there might be a reason for the specific treatment plan that we're not going to do it. We have to look at what are our goals. Are we going for muscle strength? Are we going for muscle endurance? Exercise order can affect things. Try this the next time you're at the gym, because we probably all have, when we go to the gym, a set way that we do things. You know, you go from the treadmill over to the bench press, from the bench press, to the incline press, from the incline press over to the lat pull down machine. And you have this kind of set way of doing things. And if you look at your way that you exercise, you probably have this, that it's done, you've done this for a while. Try to change that up and see what happens. It feels different. Yeah, we are creatures of habit. You're hundred percent right, right? Just like in the morning. And adaption won't improve if you stick and just do the same thing over and over again, right? Changing your frequency of exercise and your duration of exercise can overall help determine and change your resistive strength, right? And then rest. Why do we need to rest? Well, our muscles need to recover. It's just like our brain, right? Our brain needs time to encode the information we have. Well, the muscles need time to encode the information they have. Right? You need to recuperate, right? We need that ability to retake in nutrients and fluid in order to rehydrate and rebuild those muscles after tearing them down. Integration into rest and exercise can be really beneficial to patients that are compromised. So we need to be thinking about that. Do we need to be giving them rest between? But also remember, the longer those rest periods, those are activity time periods where the patient's not exercising. That means by rule of billing, we really should not be billing for those rest periods. So you have to pay attention to that, not give them enough that it affects their overall training. We're going to talk about different types of muscle contraction a little bit. Are we doing weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing exercises, right? Doing a squat is a lot different than maybe doing a leg curl or something like that. So we have to understand, are we doing weight-bearing or non-weight-bearing? 
it also can affect based upon the, the doctor's orders for certain activities, right? What type of resistance are we doing? What type of energy system are you going for, right? Are we going for those short-term anaerobic energy systems to burn through them? Are we trying to build those long-term aerobic systems up? Are we doing full range of motions or full arc exercises? Or are we doing short arc, right? So if we're doing a curl, are we only doing the first 30 or 40 degrees of range of motion? Or are we doing the full curl all the way up? I'm not familiar with the 21s. I'm not familiar with what that means. I'm not, that's a term I do not know. You may have to explain that. But, oh, seven high, okay. He wants to be 21. I want to be 21 too, I'm just gonna be honest. If I could have my, uh, the knowledge I know now and be back to 21, I'd do things a lot differently. Invest in Google, just saying. But let's think about, we talked about that force tension curve of the muscle, right? The closer I get of pulling that insertion to the origin, my force generation is going to go down. Does that make sense? So the closer I get, the shorter that muscle gets, the harder it's gonna be for that muscle to generate a ton of force. So a lot of our activity is occurring in those first few degrees of range of motion where that muscle has maximal contractibility. So we have to be thinking about that too. That's why we may do short arcs versus long arcs. The other thing is it may put a different stress on the muscle. And then what type of exercise are we doing? What kind of, how do we take a, maybe a curl, and I just keep using that because it's easy to demonstrate. How do I take that curl and change that into a functional activity for the patient? Because the more functional we make it, the more relatable we make to that patient, the more likely they are to do it, the faster they'll get better. All right? There is a force velocity relationship as the velocity of the muscle shortening increases, the muscle, I just said this, so look at that. The force the muscle can generate decreases. Maximum force is somewhere within that first 30% of the range of motion. It's almost like I've taught this class before or something. So let's think of something like the shoulder. Right, so shoulder flexion, I have 180, well, I don't have, but I should have 180 degrees of range of motion to the shoulder in order to go into shoulder flexion, right? So by kind of this force generation relationship, it says that 180 times 0.3, most of my force is generated in about that first 60 degrees of range of motion. That's where most of my force is gonna be generated. As I further move up, as that muscle gets shorter, I'm able to generate less and less force. Eccentrically, as the velocity of the muscle lengthening increases, force production decreases to a point and then plateaus. So as you let the muscle out, that force starts going up and then it'll hit a point where it's kind of flat. So if I'm doing eccentric activity with the the anterior deltoid where I'm slowing down as I come down, what you'll feel is it's gonna get harder and harder and harder and harder. And then eventually it's gonna kind of plateau out and the difficulty level is gonna stay the same throughout the rest of that arc. So we can use that with resistance training. If a patient can't get full range of motion, that doesn't necessarily mean we can't exercise that muscle, right? If a patient only has 90 degrees of elbow flexion, when I think it's 130, if I, again, I'm pretty sure it's 130, 120 to 130-ish. And they only have 90, well, guess what? They've got that first 30 degrees of range of motion we talked about over here. So we can still train that bicep. We also then wanna increase the length of that bicep as well. So they may be able to get more range of motion or length of the triceps, they can get more range of motion. But for the most part, we still strength train the bicep. There's nothing really limiting us there except for the plan of care. Make sure we're varying the training a little bit, right? We also then have to integrate function. We gotta add some balance and stability and active mobility. We can't always just be doing stuff sitting where they're static and they have no challenge to their balance or no challenge to their mobility. That's not the way humans operate. 
Humans are a mobile, agile, and hostile species. We get up and we move. So there has to be that balance there of strength, power, endurance, and balance itself. So we can work on those task-specific movement patterns while we're doing resistive exercises. You know, if you've got somebody that works at an Amazon warehouse, okay, great, let's do resistive exercises where they're moving boxes around because that's what they're gonna do in real life. And it maybe help them get better at what they do at work. There are all kinds of different types of resistance activities. We're gonna talk about this in a second on progression, but the first type of resistance we should provide that patient is gravity. Right, we talked about that yesterday with manual muscle testing, right? If they, one of the things we're gonna try first is seeing if they can get against gravity. So gravity is our first resistance. Once they're able to overcome gravity and able to do stuff against gravity sufficiently, then we can start adding additional resistance. What do you think the first type of resistance is the best to add? What do you think the best type of resistance to start adding is going to be? Here we have some isometric, we have some therabands, that's some iso. Well, let's say we're actually going to do some concentric and eccentric work. So let's skip out the iso there for a little bit. What's the first type of resistance we might add if we're talking concentric and eccentric? Okay, so we're eccentric, okay? Because we know we operate in eccentric. But let's go back to, so Mark's comment about using some bands. How do we know what level of TheraBand to start them on? Okay, so I'm starting the lowest, right? But what if that's too easy for them? Right, then you go, okay. But what if instead of starting with the bands, that's not a smiley face, that's moving, we start with some manual resistance. What's manual resistance? Yeah, we're the one doing it. Yeah, right? So let's say I've got a patient that's got a, you know, it's, we're strengthening the bicep and I start by adding some manual resistance on after they've overcome gravity. By doing that manual resistance, when I start progressing to some sort of resistive activity, Am I able to better determine what type of resistive activity to do then? Yeah, right? So by adding a little bit of manual resistance initially in that early training phase, I can better determine, like if I'm on this patient, you know, I'm working with Mark and Mark's like hulking me out and pulling me across the table every time he's doing a curl. Well, maybe putting him on a yellow TheraBand might be insulting to him. And he's like, I got this. He's just flinging that yellow TheraBand around like nothing, right? But if I added it manual resistance, like, oh, we could probably start him on a green. And it gives me a little bit better of a way to judge where to move the patient to, right? A lot of PTs really do a lot of manual resistance so they can gauge the strength of the patient. That's nothing more than doing a manual muscle test, right? Gauging what the strength level of that patient is. So manual resistance, big. Mechanical resistance is typically added after we've already kind of looked at that manual resistance. Then we can start adding some isometrics and some dynamics, right? Why do we use isometrics? Well, because it helps with stabilization of those muscles, right? What types do we have? Well, we have muscle setting, we have stabilization activities, then we have multi-angle isometrics. So your muscle setting exercises are the ones we're gonna talk about. We do the quad sets, the glute sets, the ham sets, all of those where there's very little movement occurring, right? Stabilization activities are stuff like the balls and the walls and stuff like that where we're trying to keep everything nice and tight while we're doing stuff. And we'll talk about multiple, multiple angle isometrics when we do things like um, alternating isometrics and rhythmic stabilization in PNF. When we're doing isometric training, there is an intensity of that muscle contraction, right? 
and there has to be a duration. So when we do a, when we have a patient doing something like a quad set, that's A, right? They may have a set and rep, but they also typically have to have a hold because isometric indicates that there is a period of a hold, right? So they have to be kind of thinking about that. How long am I going to have the patient hold for? Because if you're just doing isometrics and they're not holding, they may not get as much out of it. Then we may move from isometrics into those concentrics and eccentric activities where we start adding all types of activity to it, but we have to pay attention that the patient doesn't get exercise-induced muscle soreness, right? Especially with eccentric, the more we load them eccentrically, the more likely they are to get delayed onset muscle soreness. Our load has to be based upon their strength gains. Is it better to do a exercise fast and sloppy or smooth and slow? Smooth and slow, good, right? Slow motion with proper technique is better than doing 50,000 sloppy ones. And I love hearing from some of the drill instructors for people that come in. Yeah, slow motion is better than no motion for sure, right? I love hearing some of the drill instructors that for people that come in and doing like chin-ups and stuff like that, when they see some of the ways people do chin-ups and curls and stuff like that, and they just kind of laugh at them, throwing their feet out and doing backflips, trying to get a curl, a chin up. It's hilarious. You need to make sure that you're controlling your activity when they're doing any type of activity, whether it's a push up, pull up, sit up, bench press, curl, anything like that. And again, make sure that you have the energy to tolerate it, that it's going for what you want. Now there will be some cross training effect, right? If I do a pull up, could a pull up eventually help me with increasing my curl amount. Yeah, right? Even a push-up could because there's gonna be some eccentric training going on. But that doesn't necessarily mean that if I wanna get better at curls, that's all I do. So I have to do curls if I wanna get better at curls. So we have to be thinking about that. I'm gonna stop sharing here because it's just about time for you guys to go. And we'll finish this on Monday when we're back to normal stuff again. So